everyone. Welcome to the Give to Get um, Life Mastery hosted by Stefan Neff. I got a little bit of a, I'm going to share a screen here because I got a little promo, not promo, but an intro about me. So just give me a second here. Perfect. So it's a short little video and I'll read with it as, as we play it and then we'll get started. I got some super exciting um, process today as well as um, what it says on the, the title is what this, this webinar is all about. Cool. This education. Cool. There we go. So welcome to Life Mastery with Stefan Neff. So who is Stefan Neff? Well, Stefan was born and raised in Langley, British Columbia and married with two children, um, Stephen and Brandon. Awesome. Who is Stefan Neff? Well, Stefan had addictions, uh, alcohol and drug addictions for 35 years until he found a solution that works. Smart recovery, self-management and recovery training based on science using CBT, rationally emotive behavior therapy tools that work. So listen in order to disarm your loved one's addictive behaviors, addictions. So let's get started. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing. Awesome. Okay, so one of the things I want to lead into the actually the listening aspect of it. So what I'm going to share is let's talk about communication styles. So generally speaking, communication can be characterized in four different styles. So which one do you mostly frequently use dealing with conflict in your relationships? So number one, passive communication. And here's some of the points. Not standing up for your rights not setting limits or bound behavior, continually putting others' needs before your own, taking on the role of martyr, not being able to say no. I was like that. I was very, very, very a no individual. Or I couldn't say no. So number two, aggressive communication, bullying and intimidating others to get what you want, threatening people. Ignoring needs and rights of others, shouting, yelling, screaming, or physically abusing others. Number three, passive aggressive communication. Indirect communication, for example, slamming doors, giving them the silent treatment, saying something that is designed for your loved ones to hear you without even saying to them directly, using sarcasm, put downs using humor to be nasty or hurtful. Number four, assertive communication, being direct and honest with others, being able to negotiate, having a sense of give and take, asking your, your own needs to be met while respecting the needs of others, being able to say no and set limits and boundaries, being able to acknowledge when you are in the wrong. So just ask yourself that quick question and maybe ponder on for, for, for a few minutes and think about it. So cool. And be honest with yourself when you're asking that question. So let's go into positive communication. The, the four important areas in interpersonal communication are often abandoned when relationships run into hard times. I truly know it because when my relationship went into hard times, when I had the addictive behaviors, you know what, interpersonal communication just went out the window. And I'll share a little bit more a little bit later about that. Both, both parties tend to use the statements that are, that are positive, beginning with I, expressed understanding and demonstrate a willingness to share responsibility for the situation. Now, the acronym PIUS, so P-I-U-S, it can be used to help remember, and I'll explain what, what PIUS stands for us as we go along today. Remember how to get communi your communication back on track by using the PIUS acronym and the formula. I truly believe it works because it works in what we call families and friends to help the loved ones create sober uh, sobriety in their lives. So the P stands for be positive. Include positive comments in your conversation and avoid negative comments. This is not only helps in listening as the listener, but helps remember that you appreciate, appreciate someone and something about the other person. Now, think of something that you really like about them and just tell them, I love you. You love them. 
become conscious of those things that you tend to that you tend to communicate in a negative way and reframe them so you reframe it then you use positive phrase for example say what you want not what you don't want now the the i stands for i statement so the i statement is the one best communication tool i'm telling you the i statements that we have that we have in our abilities in ourselves it helps to speak to another person in a way that communicates our needs or wishes without blaming or criticizing the other person. When, when others feel blamed, I was one of those, I felt blamed and criticized until that changed. They usually become defensive, they back away. So I statements, so it's I feel. When you communicate your feelings, means what you feel inside you, you have a choice. Blaming your loved one, and I'll give you an example. You make me mad, so mad. My wife would say that so many times. You always make me mad. And that would be also another uh, disclaimer too that my wife would say. We'll put them in the defensive. And I was, I was totally defensive. I just went, I just backed away from everything that she had said in the past. Accept responsibility for your feelings when you're communicating with your loved ones. So for another example, when you drink, I feel sad or worried and concerned. See how the, the, the difference in the feeling, I feel. And then the other one is I want. Let your loved one know what you truly want from them, from what their current behavior is. Make your requests reasonable and something your loved one can actually do. So I'll give you another example. I would like if you could call me if you're going to be late for dinner. I would like for, uh, for us to spend time together, maybe go to the movies, maybe go out for something to eat. Calms the situation down, disarms it. Now, the U stands for be understanding. Show your loved one that you care about them and respect them enough to be on the path to understanding their point of view, even if you don't agree with it. This may be a bit of a challenge to do, but it works. Listen to them, really listen to them, ask the questions, and then reflect back of what you hear in a non-judgmental tone and to understand your loved one's point of view will make it much easier for you to find a common ground when you show that you are in the process of understanding about the other person's, about the other person. They are more likely to accept that you have something important to share with them. On a scale of one to five, would you give yourself a five on achieving what you want in life? If your answer is anything less than a five, right now, I have something awesome for you. Achieving your goals and living your life out of five isn't easy. Most people aren't prepared to focus, stay disciplined, and do the everyday work that is necessary to achieve amazing results. But since you're watching this, then I'm guessing that you're not one of those people. And this is an opportunity that will change your life. give to get is a global program that brings together world-class coaching and combines it with empowering masterminds and networking opportunities. We provide five-star guidance for the price of a cup of coffee a day. To find out more, click on the link in the description of this coaching session. Now, the S stands for well, accept and share. Share responsibility. Neither one of you are, are, are perfect. We're not perfect. Understanding and acknowledging your part in the problem, in the situation. Goes a long way in breaking out of the pattern of conflict. So this is a quote from Get Your Loved One Sober. It's actually a powerful book. The way you talk to your loved one not only reflects how you feel about him or her, but also sets the tone for their reaction to you. So I'm going to pull up on the, on the screen here. Just give me a second here. In some of these I statements. Okay, here we go. If you're hearing any pounding next door, that's somebody putting some new carpet in there. It's all good. Here we go. Let me pull it up on the screen. Where is I'm looking for it? Here we go. 
Okay, so this is, on one side is blaming and negative statements. So what I would like you to do is, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the first example of the, the blaming and negative statement, and then I'll go to the other side and I'll read the I statement. So here is the negative side. You and your buddies make a mess of this, of this place. Okay, on the other side, the positive I statement is, I'm glad your friends like coming here. Could you help me keep it tidy? So it looks good for, for when, company, when company comes. So what I want you to do, and if you want to take a screenshot of this, or of course, um, as, as well, you can do it on your own, but pause this video. And what I would like for individuals to do is go through these, because it's practice practice, persistence, and patience about when you're communicating with your loved one using I statements. So there's a few lists here. For example, you're no fun to be with when you've been drinking. It directs it towards them. It's a blaming situation. Don't yell at the kids that, like that. So you can use the words, for example, the I statements, I feel, you could say, I feel concerned when you're yelling at, this, at, at, at our kids. I feel concerned about the kids' well-being when you're yelling. So we can change the way we word things when we're directing our conversation with our loved ones. So go down the list. So pause and just change the I statements. And when you do actually have an I statement that you already been using, if you can change it, it's your choice. Changing to an I statement would be a powerful thing when it comes down to communicating with your loved ones. Stephan, question for you there on the sure. second one. You're you're no fun to be with when you're drink when you've been drinking. Yeah. Would it be an appropriate statement to say, "I really enjoy time with you when you're not drinking and when you're sober"? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Bruce, Bruce bang, bang even, on. Even though that wasn't an I feel, it was still an I statement. Yep, yep. As, as you're using the I, the I feel, the I want, um, it's still a feeling. Uh, I, I, I like, I. Yep. I yeah. like is, is also a feeling I like. So, okay. yep, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yep. So it changes, changes the mood. It changes the perspective yep. instead of attacking them, more of the taking responsibility of my feelings. Completely. I really like this exercise. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I use this in my meetings, continually using the I statements. And we, for example, in, in our meetings, we use I statements. And that's, I, it's, a, it's a big thing for about, about me to practice this. The individual is okay. using I. Good it's for you. Not, it's not about telling individuals what they have to do. It's because yeah. that's, you have to change. You have to stop. It's like, yep. okay, I, I feel this yep. way. I want. Yep. Cool. Yep. So yeah, you'll say, you'll, you'll see this, this video. So pause it and do this exercise. I'm, I am so grateful that, that, that uh, this exercise is out there to help individuals in all aspects, not just only addictive behaviors. It could be in an argument with your children, working with your children, working with your loved ones, means your wife or your husband. It could be a coworker. It could be a um, employee as well. So this works in all aspects of life. That's my opinion. Um, I truly believe that to be true. I use it all the time, the I statement. I, I love it, uh, Stefan. Thank you. And You're it really welcome. does work in all aspects of life. So thank you. You're welcome. Yep. This will benefit all of our members. Absolutely. It's benefited me, Bruce, like you wouldn't believe. Um, so here's some communication tips. So we all believe that um, when we're doing something and we go on a holiday, say we're going for a drive, and but we don't know where we're going. So having a plan put together a destination where we're going, we're going to put it into our GPS or we're going to look at a map to find where our destination is. So having, so, so the first tip is plan ahead. Think about what you want to say and how you're going to say it. Number two, choose the right time. That is when you both have the time and feel calm and it is likely that your loved one can be receptive. Important note. It's best to avoid communicating this important uh, information to someone that is intoxicated. In, in those situations, keep the conversation to a minimum. So number three, be brief and stick to the subject and to the point. Your loved one will be more likely to stay in the conversation. Bringing up old situations and disagreements is likely to result in your loved one becoming defensive 
about the past situations. Number four, be specific. Target a specific behavior rather than making a generalization. I'll give you an example. You get drunk every weekend. Pinpoints the past. Generalization is likely to make your loved one feel blamed and judged. Number five, so maintain calm tone of voice. And number six, goes into the pious exercise. Be positive, number six. Seven is use I statements. Number eight is to understand. Number nine, and accept and share responsibility. So let's get into the listening. So listening, the listening, I'm telling you, Bruce, um, the individuals out there, uh, once I learned about listening, listening and instead of voicing and just spewing out information all the time, it's much more powerful, especially in my and my line of work, is listening to the participants, listening to my clients. When you are communicating with someone who is rigidly holding on to their point of view, you gain nothing by disagreeing. More importantly, when you disagree and try to force the other person to accept your point of view, the other person shuts down. And I, I will share because my one, my wife was actually trying to, or she was in the process of forcing me to change. You have to go to AA. You have to go to this, this course. You have to stop drinking. I shut down until she actually started to listen and be more open and using I statements. And then I was more receptive and I started to share my feelings and I started to create change in my own life instead of the blaming. So listen in order to disarm. And that's where we gave them from the, from the title today. Although we hear the words, quite often we aren't really listening to our loved ones. Instead, we are busy reacting, judging, and providing solutions for them and disagreeing with them. Effective listening requires two things. First thing is you must gain a clear understanding of what our loved one's point of view is. Number two, we must convey our understanding back to our loved ones. Listening with genuine concern and respect to the other, other person involved. Using open-ended questions and reflect listening is the key to opening up the way for, for loved ones to care about our own opinions so that we can find a way to partner together to solve the problem that's in front of us. So emphasize in order to befriend. When we can, can we, when we can master the skill of non-judgmental listening, our loved one feels understood, respected, and more trusting. We can also demonstrate that we understand his or her point of view and how we feel about his or her situation. There is nothing to argue about and our loved one becomes less defensive. I can understand it and more open to hearing our perspective, like I mentioned before about myself. So the first step is to stop arguing <laughs> and start listening to our loved one in a way that leaves him or her feeling that their point of view, including the rationale for the addictive behavior is being respected. You don't have to agree with his or her reality or relentless of her, of their experiences, but you need to listen to and generally respect it. To do this, you have to stop the agenda. You have to drop it. Listen with only one goal in mind, to emphasize with your loved one, your point of view, and then reflect your understanding back to them. And when you feel empathy, and convey it, your loved one will very likely to understand and respect it. Whenever you convey that you understand how your loved one feels, his or her defensiveness actually will decrease. It'll start dropping away. And they start to feel more open to hear about your opinions will actually increase. The best listening skill is to be non-judgmental. When, when, you, when you judge someone, 
when they're talking. The other person often just shuts down. No judgment listening gives the, the other person a sense of freedom and acceptance. So let's go into reflective listening. Reflective listening turns down the volume on everyone's anger, builds trust, and mends fences together. The reason is that listening is only one goal. You understand the other person's point of view and then reflect it and understand it back to him or her. You don't comment on what he or she had said. You don't point out the way in the which they're a right or wrong. You don't judge them or react in any other way. Sounds easy. It does sound easy, but this skill doesn't come to people naturally. But it takes practice, patience, and persistence to continually have this skill built into you when you're dealing with your loved one with addictions. To succeed, you will need to learn, really listen, and not react to what your loved one is feeling, their wants and beliefs. Then after you think, you understand what <laughs> you were told, you will need to reflect it back to yourself in your own words, your understanding, and of what you just heard. The trick is, is without commenting, disagreeing, or arguing. Now, open-ended questions. And I use this as a key motivational um, um, tool in my own groups is the open-ended questions. And if you heard of the open-ended questions, I would love for you to do it also in another exercise on your own as well. Um, so an open-ended is ask open-ended question. It invites elaboration and thinking more deeply about an issue. It is very helpful skill for gaining insight into your loved one's point of view. An open-ended question cannot be answered in one single word, means yes or no, or a short phrase. And I'll give you an example of an open-ended question. Or oh, sorry, sorry, a, a closed question. Would you like pasta for dinner, means yes or no. An open-ended question would be, when you tell me about your trip, so it gives elaboration. You actually actually have a conversation. So what I want to do is I want to pull this this question um, that you can work on yourself. These are all closed questions, and as I pull it up on the screen, just give me a few seconds here as I get this prepared. Here we go. I'm going to share the screen, and you can see it in your living rooms. So you ask these, these, these are specific questions, of course, uh, of course, of all closed questions. So, so didn't you like that, huh? So how could you word that in a open-ended question? So Bruce, you could answer that. Uh, maybe there's another question you can answer too. Um, how could you word that? So you didn't like that, huh? And you, with the listening, you can pause this and have the screenshot too as well. Yeah, I'd say, what did you like about that? And what didn't you like about that? Absolutely. That's using the, the, the W's. Okay. So what are the W's? The what? What, why, when, where. And then the last one is the H. Who? How? Yeah, the how is H. The, the yeah. how. And I use this, and we're highly trained in this um, motivational interviewing as smart recovery facilitators. And I have it written in front of me on a continuous basis because it's asking the open-ended questions because it asks, okay. for, it asks for elaboration. Um, so on both sides of the, the families and friends, as well as the smart recovery. And so there's another question. Nice weather we're having, isn't it? So it's a very close question. So what did you like about the weather today? Or how did you like the weather today? Okay. Yeah. And then you can even right. add to it. Yeah. How did you feel about the weather? Right. And, right. Yeah. So then you open it up for a conversation. This is a conversational tool when we're dealing with our loved ones. And when you feel that it's actually expanding, then you can actually expand it much more. So, and you keep on, so 
keep on the, um, the practice of open-ended questions um, because closed questions, it's just like, yes, no, and then done. Excuse me, we, we can deal, we can work this with our wives, our husbands, our kids, having open-ended questions with our kids. And when we're dealing with um, our loved ones with um, addictive behaviors, oftentimes that their, their mind is, I would say preoccupied with something else is when they're in their, um, um, when they're in a calm state of mind is asking these questions as well. It's not when they're in their intoxication to ask these questions because also they'll all often shut down and be defensive as well. So when they're in finding the right time, <laughs> the right timing um, and having a plan put together as well for these open-ended questions. Cool, awesome, let me stop sharing. And if you want everyone to make sure you take a screen share of that, that's excellent. And if you do want these, these worksheets, I'm um, more than willing to, if you email me and absolutely you can um, email me and I will send you a copy of these two as well. And you can work on this process on your own. Stop sharing. Hello everyone. Well, thanks Bruce. Thanks Bruce, this was shorter than I thought. It was uh, much faster than I thought. Um, Cause I was gonna say we were gonna work through some exercises, but that's good. So with the closing, with the listening, like I said, having an open ear, an open heart, an open mind. To have that conversation with our loved ones, with our kids, and within our own relationships. Because when I felt pressured, blamed, and was complained, when there was complaints sent towards me from my wife, I didn't want to change. The one thing that she shared with me, she says, Stefan, I'm going to be happy no matter what, if you're in my life or not, it's your choice what you want to do in your own life. 24 hours later, I stopped drinking. That was five years ago. Because all the other stuff was, when are you going to stop or stop now? Go to these meetings. Go to do this. And all it was was blaming and complaining until she opened up and shared her feelings. And Stefan, she says, you can lie to you can lie to me, you can lie to your family, but you can't, you're unable to lie to yourself. So what are you going to do? What is your, what is your choice in life? So, and I opened it up and shut her down. So that's, that's me personally, and it helped me. So when she opened it up and started listening to my thoughts and feelings. And, and that's question it. For, question sure. for you, Stephanie. Sure, sure. How, what's the process that you see people go through when I'll say they first start this and they don't have, I'll say the open heart, they don't have the open ears. Uh, they're not asking the open-ended questions. They're not using the I statements. What's the normal progression or process that you see people going through from not having that to then them doing that? Both, both with the individual with quote unquote, the addictive behaviors and the individuals who, who is trying to help and support. What happens is the, the individual means a loved one gets frustrated because they're, they're for example, because they want to help. They, right. It's human nature. Um, this is especially to mothers with their, with, their, with their teenagers or their young adults, or sometimes even adult um, individuals, these children. Um, they want to tell them what they have to do and they want to find solutions for them. And so when they, that's in the beginning stage before they learn the tools. And then what happens on the other side is the loved one feels blamed or complained that they have no choice. The choice aspect of it is gone. So there's no choice involved. So when they start to practice these tools, they use the I statements and they use the open-ended questions. They mend, like I, like I, like I mentioned, they mend the fences, but they start to actually communicate much even though the individual may be still in their addictive behaviors. Yep, 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 yep. But they still get become closer because now the loved one is actually understanding their feelings. But in the beginning, all they wanted to do was change them. They wanted to fix them. They wanted to them to stop because the individual who's a loved one is in pain as well, as well as the, the one with the addictive behaviors in pain. So they're both in pain, but when they open both hearts up, and that takes a process of self-acceptance, acceptance of others and acceptance of life. 
And that's also one of the smart recovery tools as well. Those three tools are all, all separate ones, but they all combine, combine into one. Because sounds like you, that might, that sounds like that might be your next session. I uh, yeah, no, <laughs> uh, that, And that one is, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, actually would be a, a, a good keynote for that one too. Um, acceptance of others, uh, acceptance of self and acceptance of life. That's a powerful tool. Acceptance of, of, of others. I, I did uh, the other day and, in, in my meetings, I don't want to get too far into it, but it yeah. was absolutely mind blowing. The, um, the the crosstalk and the communication with the individuals was phenomenal. It was life changing. Put it that way. Acceptance Good of others. You. Yeah. So it sounds like it is a process. Yeah. Am I am I correct in in, in saying it sounds like the majority of the time it starts with the loved one, not with the individual with the addictive behavior not the individual with i'll say the behavior challenge you you guys don't like using the words addictive behaviors you like using what is it uh yeah un, unwanted addictive behaviors yeah un, unwanted unwanted behavior so or it sounds like it usually them. starts with the loved one to start to open the heart to start to listen to start to use the i statements to start to use the i um uh, open-ended questions to start to quote unquote use the empathy to then bring the other person along. Yep, absolutely. And then we can, yeah, then you start to have that communication together. Then you can start to ask them questions. So when do you want to go to, to treatment or what is your next step? Asking the, the, the questions. And then we start that process. Oftentimes they're both working together because we have on the one side, the ones with addictions and then on the loved ones. So 75% of the individuals when they're both going to meetings, is 75% uh, higher than if only just the one is going. Just the one. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So it, it, it works in tandem. Um, Super. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. And again, love the all black background with the white t-shirt. Thank it's you so a, much, Bruce. It's a really, really cool effect. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. yeah. Um, look forward to the to the next session. As I said, it's going to be a, key, a keynote and it looks like Bruce found a little topic for me and we'll see what happens. But I, I truly believe that um, I am on the path to really helping others help themselves. So if you're ever interested in knowing more, and it's not only individuals with addictions, we have individuals with anxiety, depression, um, and much, much more uh, on, the, on, the, on the loved one side as well, is not only with the loved ones with addictions, it could be the loved ones with anxiety or depression that we're working with. So be an open mind that it's much more than just um, addiction tools. These are life tools and life skill tools so everybody super. thank you bruce thank you everyone i'm super grateful for give to get uh, the boomerang i love this group i love bruce and i'm so grateful for this thank you everyone thank you Stefan. Yep. bye-bye see ya